Dr. Kalsik C., welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm very, Bye. I'm very eager to speak with you, and uh, to talk about your research on memory and implications for the treatment of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other uh, degenerative nervous system disorders. But before we go there, uh, it might be good for our listeners to have to know something about your background and how you came to be in the position involved in, you know, in potentially groundbreaking research. So uh, take us back and tell us about your journey, if you will. You know, yeah, so um, I uh, grew up in a, in a rural village in India. And uh, from there, then I came to New York City to uh, do my, uh, my PhD. Um, and from there, I was working with, you know, yeast and cells. I was studying protein synthesis far away from brain. And after finishing my uh, PhD, I decided to switch field. And I thought I will study something that I can spend the rest of my life thinking about it. Yeah. And, <laughs> what, what, what was that? <laughs> and that's when I decided I will go to the nervous system. Uh-huh. Um, because clearly... Um, um, I, you know, you, if you think about the biology in general, um, actually the brain is the one that makes us all the questions and it sure. makes us wonder about things. So if you want to understand one thing in biology, you want to understand the organ that makes you do all those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're also going for the complexity. You were, you were not taking the easy path. You said, I'm going to go to the most challenging thing out there. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, um, and so I looked around and I, I, I thought that the memory would be the, in the place to, uh, to go because it's sort of the essence of how brain uh, sees the world, how it interacts with the world and how it makes sense of the world. Memory, memory. okay, yeah. So, so I thought, okay, we'll go and uh, look for what are particularly the long lived memories. You know, the memories that stays with us for our lifetime. Yes. And, okay. Uh, and so, um, is has was your search involving uh, human research or animal research? So, uh, it was most. It, it's my work thus far has been with animal. Okay. And one of the reason uh, for that is that if you, as you mentioned, the complexity of the nervous system, right? Yes. So there are two ways to approach the problem. Either you can look the overall output of the system. And that would be, you know, it's a psychologist that you are trained as, I guess. Um, that how, how we behave, how we react. And the other is to really understand how brain works. Yeah. And when you want to understand how brain works, human brain is not the place you want to start. <laughs> start with an easier brain. You want to start with the easier brain with a somewhat, you know, a little less complexity, yet some of has the same essential features of. And that's when I decided to go and work with snail. Um, I'm sorry, to work with? With, with, with snail, sea slugs. Snail, sea slugs, okay. Yeah, in Columbia University with uh, Dr. Eric Kandel. Oh, um, wow, Kandel, I certainly know his name. <laughs> yes. And yeah. so that's why I learned essentially, and the question that essentially um, that I decided to study, which is perhaps the most elemental problem in neurobiology. And that is, we know that the neurons communicate uh, through this particular structure called synapse. Synapses, yeah. And the way, so the information flows through the synapses and the way you would change the nervous system or you will create memories by changing the communication between the synapses. Okay. And so the question that I became interested in, that how do you change the communication between a synapse as you are learning something? And more importantly, how are we going to maintain it for years and years and years so that uh -huh. your memory will stay around? Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the, the sea slug brain and why <laughs> that recommended itself to you? So sea slug was, you know, the, the Eric, uh, Eric Kendall started out uh, studying sea slug in the, in the, in the 60s. So, and he spent okay. his whole life. And the reason I was drawn to it uh, for, for several reasons. First of all, it had a simple nervous system. 
Second, the neurons are large enough that you can actually uh, culture them very easily in a, in, a, in a Petri dish. And you can actually look at individual synapses. Uh -huh. So as you know, the synapses are really tiny, tiny, tiny structures. Yeah. And if you go to a, a normal human brain or most mammalian brain, a given neuron will make thousands and thousands of synapses. So it is very hard to study it, one of them in isolation. Yeah. In comparison, C-slug has a relatively simplified system where the neurons make relatively less snap number of synapses and they're big enough that you can go and study them in isolation. So I thought that's the way to go and figure out at the very basic level, how synapses talk to each other, how they change the way they talk to each other. Uh -huh. Once they change, how they keep themselves for a long time. Yeah, fascinating. Fascinating. So uh, you have a very good PR department there at the uh, research institute that you're working with. And uh, they sent me uh, in PR speak, it sounded very exciting, you know, breakthrough <laughs> and other words like that. Uh, was the, uh, Tell me about the quotes breakthrough study. And uh, if there was a, a hypothesis that you went into the study with. Yeah, it, actually, the discoveries we made were, you know, if you'd have asked me 20 years ago, that's what I'll be working with, I will say no way. Yeah, right. <laughs> and as you know, that's the perhaps the beauty of science, right? That you started out with one way and it takes you to another direction. Sure. So I started out with asking a very uh, simple question, and that is how a synapse change itself when it receives an ex you know, stimulus or an experience, okay? And as you know, in biology, at the end, everything that happened, there is some proteins at the end of it. Okay? okay. So let's let's step back and think about, I will use an analogy, try to explain the problem. Yeah. So DNA is essentially the, the material. So you are supposed to building a house. Yeah. So DNA has all the information to build the house. What kind of house you want, what you want to have it there. But the proteins are actually the bricks. The mortars, okay. the glasses, they build yeah. the house. Now, your memory, every time you form a memory, you build a brick house, and the bricks are the protein. But the proteins have actually a short duration. So after a couple of days, they will disappear. Okay. So now imagine you have a brick house, and every three, four days, half of the brick disappears. So over time, <laughs> the house should disappear. Yes. And your memory should disappear. And it's actually a very simple but elemental problem in neuroscience. So the question is, how do you going to keep this house with bricks that's going to disappear periodically? And there are two solutions to the problem, right? You have a special kind of brick that although most brick disappears, the special kind of brick can stick around for a long time. Yeah. Or the other possibility is that every time a brick disappears, you put a new brick in the same place. So the structure can turn over, you know, individual component, but you still maintain the structure. Okay, now let me just back you up a little bit because I'm thinking about our brain. Yes. And I'm thinking, you know, that it's full of, uh, of synaptic, of, of neurons mm -hmm. packed very tightly together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are all these synaptic connections, mm -hmm. but I don't, but our brain is the the neurons aren't disappearing, are they? No, but neurons are not disappearing. Your synapses are disappearing because this is the functional anatomical entity that's created. But the synapse within the synapse, there are proteins. That is the one that is working and making synapse function, right? Okay. And the proteins they disappear. Okay. So they turn over. So this is actually the biology at its most basic. Thank you. Because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, need, I need it at that level. Exactly. Oh. Oh. You know, so the, you know, the, the protein is life. So the DNA is the blueprint of life, but protein is the expression of life because the DNA encode a series of you know, amino acids, they tie together, but once they fold into a structure and making the protein, then actually we have function. So proteins are the functional output. So synapse, neuron, anything you say, they function because inside them, there are protein that are doing the job. Okay. 
but the protein disappear. And so then every time you the protein disappear, either you put a new protein there or the function will disappear. So anytime you're creating memory, you are actually changing the makeup of proteins in the synapse. All right. Um, so so the, essentially the, the, the solution that we found that there are proteins in the brain, they actually clump within the synapse. And when they clump within the synapse, they change the synapse, they change the activity of the synapse, the way the synapse communicating with each other and helping to create memory, store memory. That's what we found. So, so the clumping is good? Exactly. So that okay. then we asked, okay, the protein is clump clumping. What sort of protein clump is this? And we looked at them very carefully and we surprisingly found that these clumps looks like protein clumps that we have been studying for a long time as the cause of many of the diseases that is amyloids. So the, the, what we started out to understand how we create memory and I, how we, you know, animal hold on to them. Yeah. And it turned out that at the very bottom of that process is a protein that clumps and create a stable substrate or representation of memory. But the protein clump looks very much like proteins clump we've been associated with loss of neuron, loss of memory, various diseases of the human nervous system. These are what we call in the brain the the uh, the tangles and exactly. uh, tangles block. and the plaques. Uh, tangles and plaque, yeah. So you're saying that the tangles and plaque are made up of the same substances as the con the memory connection in the synapse. No, no. no Two okay. types of protein. There is a one type of protein that is helping us to create a memory. But, okay. and they clump. But there are other proteins that are also can clump. But when these other proteins that are involved in suppose Alzheimer, Parkinson, these are different proteins actually. For different disease, diseases, there are different proteins. Okay. And when these proteins clumps, they cause disease. But there is a different protein when it clumps, it causes memory stabilization, memory formation. But if you look at the clump, how do they look, how they organize, they look very similar. Okay. And now question is, what's the importance of the similarity? Yeah. The importance <laughs> is that the basic idea for all the diseases is that the reason that different proteins causing you all this problem, when they clump, they form a very specific type of structure. These structures are so stable, they form like a fiber, you know, like a string. Yeah. This, once they form the string, the cells don't know what to do with them and they causes all these bad things and eventually leads to, you know, loss of memory, loss of synapse, loss of neuron and bad things. And most of the diseases are actually this nature, how the strings are basic properties. And yes. Have a, okay. Uh, other but, de de degenerative nervous diseases. Nervous diseases. Yeah. What we found that a different protein can form exactly same type of string can be organized exactly the same way. And you would predict that if they're organized this way, this would cause disease, but it doesn't. It actually does something exactly opposite. And so okay, that, that's, have, an, that's an important point. Say yeah. that again. <laughs> yes. So the thing is that, so if some proteins, when they will sort of organize themselves in a string, in a fiber, uh, they will lead to bad things. Yeah. And it's different protein that we studied it seems to be forming a very similar type of strings. It's also organized exactly the same way. And normally you would predict if you do not know anything about it, oh, this protein should also cause bad things because it looks very much similar. Yeah. But it does not, it does exactly opposite. So, so I would, yeah, I would think the challenge then would be to figure out how to dissolve the protein that make up the, the tangles and plaque exactly. without, without dissolving the important ones that are sustaining memory. Exactly. Very good. So I think I succeeded in explaining the basic problem. So, yeah. 
<laughs> very so good. it immediately raises some some very interesting you know questions, and I sure. think for as a scientist, that's the part I'm most excited about. Yes. So if they are look both looks very similar, they're organized. So why is bad and the, why the other one is good? Is there any way they're different? Is there anything that is different we haven't been able to pick it up? That's question number one. Yeah. So if you could find something that, were, that was different, then you might be able to target it. Exactly. Yeah. And now we have some hint because we have solved the, 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 you know, so the atomic level. We know how they're actually built and we have some hint. So we will At the atomic it. level. Exactly. Wow. Because mm -hmm. that's the way you want to go. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is even more intriguing. <clears throat> that is the way we thought about so far that how these strings or fibers are formed in the brain and in many other places, that these are uncontrolled because the body did not want it. It happened because something went wrong. Okay, yeah. it's unintended. But what we are finding, our study would suggest that the no, there are cases where brain actually intentionally building these fibers. Uh -huh. Okay, so if they're intentionally building them, that means they also know how to take it apart. Okay, and this is also also making me think of cancer, though, where you have cells replicating un unintentionally and hopefully for, it, which is a, a useful process in the body, in other situations, but it gets out of control. Is there any relationship between, you know, uh, and, and thinking about cancer and thinking about this problem? Uh, um, directly, no, because, you know, the first thing about the, at least the context of the nervous system, as you know, neurons are non-dividing. So that's, um, that's the fundamental. Uh -huh. But in terms of, so the general idea that you raise is actually, a, it's an important one. So diseases are often an anomaly of a normal process. In case of yeah. cancer, cells divide normally when it cannot control or you have abnormal cell growth that leads to cancer. Here, the same thing. The way we thought about amyloids so far and the diseases, that that is an abnormal, it's a completely anomalous process. And there is no cellular process that is akin to it. But our studies would suggest that the brain is actually perhaps normally utilizing amyloid. And in that formulation, the disease become an anomaly of a normal process. It's a very okay. different way of thinking. So yes. I actually want to emphasize one thing. I do not study the diseases, you know, my goal is to try to understand memory. But in that we discover is that, that perhaps the disease that we've been looking at in a one way, perhaps we need to rethink. Yes. Uh, I think that's the, perhaps the most important insight I would suggest that what our work is revealing. It's not immediately solving the disease, it's not providing a cure, it's just providing a completely new way to think about it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, so why you, that is important? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. So, why we need to think about it? And the reason we need to think about it, um, you know, the neurodegenerative diseases we know for a long time. So the, but there are a couple of things we do not understand at all. <clears throat> One, why the disease actually happens in a very specific parts of the brain as you grow old, okay? Yeah. And although the proteins that cause these diseases are actually all over the body, in all parts of the brain, but for some reason, very specific protein in a very specific time of your life will cause a disease in a very specific part of the brain. And this is a central mystery. We do not understand, okay? The second problem is that we've been trying to come up with treatment strategies, okay? And our goal was that if we somehow prevent or if we somehow dissolve the clump, it will cure the disease. But unfortunately, so far, we have failed dramatically, you know, yeah. it's really unfortunate. So this implies there is a basic understanding of the disease process is lacking, why in a specific parts of the brain, and seems like we need to new way to approach the problem. And our studies would suggest 
if brain is really normally utilizing amyloids to do things, then you can begin to imagine how in a very specific situation, very specific parts of the brain will be susceptible because maybe this is where the problem is. And the other thing is that instead of trying to figure out how to take care of these protein clumps from outside, if we can somehow know how brain normally builds them and takes it apart, if you understand the basic fundamental process, then you can use that process to go after this. You know, it just gives yeah. a very different yeah. way to look into the problem. It provides a very different avenues to approach the problem. Right, right. So what kind of response have you received from other neuroscientists? <laughs> and, are, and are you getting any pushback from, uh, you know, skepticism, uh, uh, you know, that's the scientist's job, right? Is to oh, absolutely. poke holes in other guy's ideas. Oh, oh no, 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 no. You know, I, I, but that's what makes science science, right? Right. Science exactly. has several components. Having an idea and more importantly than coming up with a set of experiments that actually test the ideas. And then there has to be a consensus among all scientists that this idea and these experiments are really supporting what we are thinking. Right. So that's why skepticism is the most healthy part of science. So that's yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, the idea actually was, and from the beginning, the central idea that people struggle with, that for 50, 60 years, we thought the protein clumpings are bad. Now, how protein clumping can be good? First yeah. of all, what's the evidence that it is good? And then, you know, how does it actually then work? So until we solve the atomic structure, we could not be know for sure that how similar they are. But once uh -huh. you solve the atomic structure and if you compare two things, then you know how similar they are. So I think now we provided enough evidence and not for the others, for myself, it's now we know for amyloid that exists at least in animal brains. And there is no controversy. Now the key question is how widely it is utilized across species. Is it happening in human brain? That we, I would not know yet. And because that's a key question, right? Because we looked at animal model, snails, fly, mouse. The key question is, is it really happening in our brain? Um, because that's where the diseases manifest. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I think um, that's that's the one area we are growing, and I think our early evidence are pretty encouraging. So um, I'm encouraged by what we are seeing in the human brain. Do Do we think that have we found anything like Alzheimer's in any other species? You know, so th that's the thing. I mean, if you think about these diseases that we study of human diseases that happen so-called, you know, 50, 60 years uh, in life, late stage of life, um, you really, it's very hard to study those diseases in an animal because most of the time when you are talking about cognitive uh, deficit, you ask a question, you cannot ask a question. But what you can study in other system, the memory as a general process, Okay. Right. And because if you think back and think very in a simple term, memory is actually an animal's ability to process information, understand the relationship between them, and then create a representation in the brain. And so that in future, if they see the same thing, they know what to do. Yeah. Uh, and so that basic features is actually present across animal kingdom and memory, the way we think about getting disrupted in this disease state, you can begin to ask, are there fundamental processes in the memory? Are they getting sort of disturbed when the, having an Alzheimer's disease or other you know, neurodegenerative diseases? So those are the thing. But at the same time, we, our brain has some capacities that we have not seen in other species yet. Right. So yeah. there has to be something that is different. So it's very important. Eventually, if we really want to connect to the human diseases, we need to look at human brain. Yeah, I'm wondering if at a gross anatomical level, I mean, the way we know about the the uh, plaques and and tangles is uh, people who are having cognitive problems after mm -hmm. they die. You look at the brain. And you can see the tangles mm -hmm. and the plaques. So that's my question is, 
have we been able to, in any other species, to look at brains and see, oh, my goodness, they've got tangles and plaques just <laughs> like we do. <laughs> that, that's for, uh, that's for uh, to my knowledge, not. But people have, been, uh, people have created animal models where they can take these proteins that in the human brain, express them, and create the plaques and tangles and create some of the symptoms of the disease. Interesting. Yeah. And that has been done. Uh, but they, there is always a controversy or not a controversy, debate is whether they are truly recapitulating the diseases of the human brain or they are recapitulating some aspect that resembles. You yeah. know, so that, but that's a debate that's going to go on. But in general term, yes, you can create tangles and plaques and all those things in a mouse brain, in a rat brain or in a, any other brain, even in the fly brain, if you express and you can create them, yes. So I would think there are probably scientists who are creating those and then trying to figure out ways, okay, now that we've created it, is there some way that we can get rid of it? Exactly. I mean, that, that, yeah. has, been the, that has been the traditional approach thus far. Uh -huh. you create an animal model, and then you try to come up with a, a therapy in you know, some way, test them. And when they work there, you bring it back to the human and see whether it's working or not. Yeah. And so far, our attempt to translate these treatments from the animal to the human brain, particularly the neurodegenerative diseases, has not. And um, I lost a word there. They every now and then the uh, it's cutting off. Kind of, yeah, just, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. So the you know so that the general approach has been that you create these animal models for these diseases. And then you screen them through these different drugs or different treatment uh, ideas. And if they work, then you uh, try to bring them to the human and then see how well it's working. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so far, that approach has not been very successful. Okay. And so you talked about wanting to look at the atomic structure. Mm -hmm. And as, is that a process that's, that you've started? Uh, and how does one look at the atomic structure? I mean, do, you, <laughs> do you have some kind of very powerful uh, yes, electron yes. microscope or what? How's yes. that done? So, so the traditionally, so we have already looked at the structure of, um, from the from the fly brain, um, but we are now trying to look at the same plaques isolated from human brain and look into them. And the way you look at atomic structure, two ways. The traditionally used to be extracrystallography, where you take a, a protein and a crisp protein crystal and zap them with X-ray, and it, you know, from the X-ray diffraction pattern, you can deduce the atomic uh -huh. structure. So right okay. now, it, it, this, there is a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. Okay, uh, where you take I like the, the sound of that. <laughs> exactly. So you, in a very, very cold, you actually take your protein and you zap it through the electron beams and from the diffraction of the, you know, the, how the electron beam scatters from that, you can deduce how the atoms are actually organized within your protein. So it's actually remarkable. Essentially what you are seeing actually life at its most elemental level. Because yeah. how these atoms are organized, that's making your synapse fire. That's how making your brain work, yeah. right? So once yeah. you have that level of understanding, you see really nature at its best. I, I can <laughs> I see your excitement about that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yes. It's the best job I have in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so what? where are you at now in the process? How would you describe where you're at and what the next steps are going to be? Okay. For us, um, the, the, there are two uh, next steps that are most critical for us. First, to solve, to look what's going on in the human brain in terms of the, the nature of the clump, the structure of the clump, that one. And the second and more importantly, try to understand how brain normally builds these protein clumps and takes them apart, which is a very different way of thinking about this protein clump than that you know, the way we've been thinking from last almost 70, 80 years, that yeah. these are happening randomly, but that's not the case. And so my goal is that if we truly understand that process, then we can begin to understand what goes wrong um, when this abnormal things are happening. Brain just 
are just randomly putting together things because the process that we're controlling it has lost or it lost the ability to dissolve the unintended one. That's why these things are happening. Or maybe it is a consequence because if you live long enough, you are making all of this clumping over time. And this is just a manifestation of time. Because as you know, that if you look at the most of the diseases of the nervous system, Alzheimer, Parkinson, synuclein, the genetic link actually explain very small percentage of the population, only 5% roughly. The 95% okay. of the population comes down of the disease with simply aging. If we live long enough, there is a chance of coming up with the disease. So the question is, it is part of the normal biology of the brain, something about the biology of the brain that making it susceptible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're, is it true that we're living longer than we used to live and that oh, maybe that's of created course, a, of course, of course, a, you know, people, people would, I guess, think, well, with aging, things are going to start breaking down. <laughs> We're going to get broken one way or another. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, aging is a key predictor of coming up with these diseases. But, you know, one other thing that, you know, we also uh, as a scientific community is trying to understand is that if you look at a brain of a relatively old person, you can see actually a lot of plaques and tangles, but not necessarily everybody who has plaques and tangles has the disease. I've heard that. Exactly. So the, the question is then, what is about? So there are many ideas. Maybe it's not the pox and the tangles. Maybe there are some invisible small clumps inside the neuron that are the bad. You know, so this is a very complicated disease. Yeah. And I think that we came from the, so the proverbial left field, right? <laughs> we came from studying how memories are formed into a process that has been associated with loss of memory. So what I am most excited about is actually giving us a new way to look at this very age old problem. Yeah. And, um, and often that's where, you know, a lot of the excitement and new ideas emerges. So yeah. Um, yeah, well, congratulations on that. Now, uh, what's your role in this process? Are you part of a team? Are you the team leader? How many people are involved in this? Yeah, I'm, so to put it mildly, yes, I am the I'm now, I'm the team leader because that's my. But it's it's essentially science. At the end of the day, is a collective process. Uh -huh. you know, um, I started out as a as a student and a postdoc. I worked with others. We have ideas, and now I have students. I have, you know, students that have PhDs. And so we are collectively look at this problem. And, um, you know, there are different people with different expertise. And so we have to all come together, both experimentally and conceptually and put all of our head together. So at the end of the day in science, you know, the, the individuals get credit for the discovery. But it's really the case that, mm -hmm. in, at least in biological sciences, experimental sciences, it's usually a number of people involved. Sure. Sure, I can understand that. I, I think this is a, such a, a very important problem, you know, that you're tackling uh, because it's a major source of anxiety for so many people, the people that I know, you know, as soon as people hit middle age, they start forgetting things. <laughs> and <laughs> so they wonder, you know, is this, a, does this mean I have, yes. uh, do I have Alzheimer's? And of course, uh, the other thing that complicates this is there's early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. We have to think, well, it's not just age, maybe, or, you know, why is it that some people have this early manifestation? Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel a certain amount of, of relief that uh, I know that I'm not going to get early onset yeah. <laughs> Alzheimer's because I'm too old. <laughs> so I just have to worry about the later one. Um, well, but, in life, we have to worry yeah. about something. Um. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And, uh, and right now that, you know, the pandemic, I would say, has, has uh, uh, shifted people's worries considerably. Um, and it, I kind of want to ask you a personal question since you're from India and India is suffering so much yes. right now. Um, 
this must be hard on you. Maybe you have family or friends who are dealing with yeah. that situation. Uh, thank you for asking. Yes, I mean it, it's a yeah. I mean, of course, you know, I have a both a personal connect, you know, emotional connection, and of course, of course uh, my friends and families are there. Um, I think yes, it's it's a really bad situation there, and I think as we have learned um, and as we have seen that this problem has two parts to it, like all other problems. There's a real problem and problem that are manufactured by the, the system. Yes, <laughs> right. And right. when you have the combination of both, the situation gets really bad. And I think yeah. that they really took their eyes off from the problem. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, the people are, the general public are suffering, paying the price for that. Yeah. Uh, is, is there anything that I have not thought to ask you that I should be asking you? <laughs> uh, no, I think that the only thing maybe I will add, I will add a bit about, you know, the, the Institute, you know, in the sense that as you, you know, you sort of did not, you know, the stars in the middle. Um, so the Institute, essentially, you know, the kind of work I have done, it requires a long term investment in a problem. And really you are in the boundary of knowledge. So you do not know whether you're going to fall off the cliff or you are really paving a new path. Yes. The boundary is very pain. So somebody has to be willing to you know, let you take the risk and go with it, knowing that you can fail, you know? Yeah. And I was very fortunate the way to be in a place and in a system that sort of allow you to explore, allow you yeah. to go in your path. <laughs> Yeah. So and, where, where is the funding coming from for this research? So this is coming from, uh, you know, Mr. Stowers. Uh, he started this uh, company called American Century, um, sort of an insurance company. And, um, and then, of course, it got very big and he became very successful. He's from Kansas City. Um, and so he has a very uh, keen interest on basic sciences, although he went to, you know, sort of um, insurance and all those things. And so he decided to actually gave most of his wealth to do something which is actually very unusual. This institute actually decided not to focus on a disease, not to solve, you know, that traditionally people would do. You know, yeah. people suffer from a disease and they give their money to start something to solve the disease. Right. This institute is actually very unique. It decided it will just go and study the basic biology, how the, the biological system actually works. And if you think about the problem I'm doing, I'm not actually trying to solve Alzheimer's disease. I'm trying to understand how brain creates a stable representation inside, mm. right? Yeah. It's a fundamental process. Right. And guess from this fundamental process that you would not have otherwise thought of, so I think that was a very, you know, far reaching, you know, um, there was a true foresight in setting up a place like this. Yes. And yeah. All I, can yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I can, I can see that because I've heard the complaint elsewhere that uh, the government often doesn't taxpayers have difficulty thinking, seeing the justification yeah. of supporting research that looks silly Exactly. You know, that uh, what you're studying the brains of fruit flies. Exactly. <laughs> you're putting our taxpayer dollars on fruit flies. Don't we have bigger problems than that? So, so that's what you're up against. And uh, I agree with you that uh, Stowers uh, appears to be, is he still alive? He seems to be very visionary. Well, Unfortunately, he passed away, but his wife and his family, you know, they're around and they are, they are really, they are really dedicated to make this thing work in a way uh, that is very different from you uh, normally expect, you know. Yeah. And so from that standpoint, from being a scientist, you know, of course, I'm excited about what I do, but it's gra I'm grateful that somebody really helps you on that problem. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so, so you you've been very fortunate. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a big component of you know. Yeah. Any, any scientific journey has there are moments, there are people help you in a way that you would not anticipate it, and just pushes your life towards one direction or other. Right. Right. Uh, and and this is a scenario. If in a, in another place and other circumstances, I don't know whether we'll be able to follow this problem 
to the rigor and to the depth we have been able to do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very well, fortunate. Well, I I wish you uh, Godspeed in the in your mission and uh, and that the funding continues and that your your hunches move us in the right direction. Uh, Thank you so much. 